And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, previously here for for the for our very rough, very rough, very... <laughs> very bloody introduction to chaotic flux and now back for a th for a third issue the one and only don't call him major scott Payne. <laughs> how you, do how you doing everybody? today man Ricky builder how are you i am doing good i am doing good i'm Excellent. still not 100 percent used to it not being winter um yep <laughs> but i'm pretty i'm pretty sure winter is going to come back with some sort of with some sort of surprise next month because uh, that always uh, happens <laughs> i'm just about to say do you feel like we've gotten a full winter or there's still more to come um you never winter never you never you get a reprieve from winter around here you never mm. le you never um it never leaves it just get it just gives you a break um and I will I will admit that some that some of the winter storm stuff was a bit of a dark comedy for me because <laughs> because of how many how many times I hear people talk talk about talk about the winter from their perspective and saying how how can you st how can you stand that how can you stand that kind of cold and I say I dress in layers <laughs> and now and now a whole bunch of people have 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 had to get a first hand taste of what I go through every year right. But all the now back when and it, forth. <laughs> yeah. Now with I with issue th with um issue three of chaotic flux, which first mm -hmm. first off um. So th this is your th this is your third go around with the with this particular series. Um, mm -hmm. what what would you say have been some have been some of the big takeaways that you've learned since since launching the past two Kickstarters and now with this one? Um, well, I mean, I, one of my biggest feelings, like, uh, as far as, like, things I wish I did different was um, uh, get a platform going uh, beyond, you know, just doing uh, shows, which has been working out pretty well, mm -hmm. uh, other people's shows, but uh, I definitely stress people, you know, to do their own uh, channel as well, do your own shows and, and host other uh, um, creators uh, and also do your own kind of um, uh, different shows, uh, like you know, talking about comic books or video games or mm -hmm. whatever you're into. Um, I'm in the process of, of uh, doing it now. I was in the process before, but I got distracted with this book, putting this book together and, and various other things. But I'm pretty uh, headstrong uh, this time around on getting something going. Uh, but uh, so definitely, if you're looking into doing this kind of thing, you know, uh, definitely think, seriously consider doing your own uh, like YouTube channel um, sort of thing or your or t Twitch stream, anything you can do to get yourself out there visually so that people recognize, can recognize you, uh, get to know you, and uh, of course your, your projects as well. Um, and uh, just, I, I guess, um, there's a lot of things I've learned about uh, printing um, last campaign, and then also uh, printing on demand. Uh, I found new outlets for this campaign uh, to do more of that kind of thing, and um, so I'm able to branch out a little more in that way. So uh, I don't. I mean, I know a lot of people will be able to just like discover all that stuff up front. Like myself, I did not discover all that up front, but uh, you will, you know, figure out new ways of doing things and and um, uh, easier ways of doing things, which is because there's more and more options becoming available uh, as more companies come out and more people are willing to do uh, flexibility for people like us that are willing to make our projects. Mm -hmm. Now, the other, the other, the other thing I'm cu the other thing I'm curious about because um, another another person I've had another person I've had on. Um, Michael Beacon did things sli did things slightly differently on this front. With the first two issues, you had set that up as a um, two-parter. 
Right. And I'm cur I'm curious what I'm curious what your take on that particular move was in hindsight. Um. Well, so that was kind of a a bridging of that part of the storyline. Uh, I actually my original vision for Chaotic Flux how I was going to do the series was a series of graphic novels. Um, so you would have gotten you know four or five issues length in each book but looking into that more it was going to be a lot of money to put up front to pay the artists and um also it costs more to print those books especially in bulk uh, of that size so um i didn't really have all that money to to put up front that not that much and so i decided to pull it back and um do it in issues by uh, uh versions yeah. um I do plan to release volumes at some point, uh, but right now it's just you know individual issues. Um, After a while, you're planning on put, planning on putting it in in some sort of trade. Yes, yes. Um, so issues one and two, um, because those stories are so, because that one was really meant to be really close together. The way it, it jumps from one to the other, it, the way it bridges. Mm -hmm. um, issue three is a little more of. Uh, there's more flexibility there. So also I didn't want to call issue three, you know, uh, aliens versus monsters part three of three, you know, that just, I was like, okay, well you get the big idea that a lot of, um, the story is, uh, you know, horrible monsters and then, you know, um, alien hybrids clashing together. There's other elements as well, but our, since it was Athara's backstory, I was establishing, uh, the being ever backstory in the first two issues as well as uh, how she is in the present time. Mm -hmm. uh, it felt right for me to do the, the part one there and then the part two, Aliens vs. Monsters, uh, meaning as a kind of, uh, you know, a, a good leaping off point for people to, to jump into it. Um, and then issue three, the reason why I'm calling it Relentless is because uh, this issue is designed as a very quick action um, uh, pacing. So it feels like this, as you're reading it, it has this relentless um, uh, explosion of action that, that comes at you and goes and goes and goes. Um, now there's, there's a, a course story in there and, and uh, good, great character growth that I've thrown in as well, but there's, a, there's more action that feels in this one and the other ones, especially the third act, it gets really crazy in the third act as far as action and, and violence and gore and <laughs> lots of fun stuff. Oh yeah. And when now when it comes to when it comes the other thing I wanted to wanted to ask about is the whole the whole nature with um flashbacks because mm. um I've seen I've seen some authors have a very scub attitude about the use of about the use of flashbacks since right. it could um it can mess with it can mess with narrative um flow mm -hmm. when it comes what's your what's your take on the right and wrong ways to utilize flashbacks especially in a sequential medium like um comics uh it's definitely tricky um i after doing issue one where i i did it it starts out at the beginning in the future from the present and then it jumps to the present and it goes in the past mm -hmm. I kind of now wish I didn't do that because it's 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 kind of weird doing different times like that. Three different ones, not just two. Two, I think, is okay. But doing three, um, you know, um, I still love the issue. I, I still think it's it works really well. But at the same time, if you really think that hard about it, it's it's kind of weird. So, um, uh, but I, I'm, like I said, I'm still satisfied with the issue. The people do like it a lot. Um, but I don't think I would ever go back to doing the three times at the same in one issue, uh, or even the story at all. I'm kind of now just progressing to the future point instead of flashing to it or back and forth on that. And just concentrating on the present and the past. Um, and even the past stuff, I'm going to get um, beyond that. Uh, right now, the past stuff is mostly establishing Zathara's past. And uh, there will be some other flashbacks later on in the series for some of the characters, but I'm going to get to a point where it's just going to focus on the present. 
Um, there's a lot of stories. So you see yeah, their question on how I feel about jumping back and forth and like other stories. Um, I'm actually a pretty good fan of that kind of stuff. Um, particularly like Quentin Tarantino. He likes to do that now and then like with the uh, uh, Pope Fiction kept jumping back and forth between past and present throughout that movie. Um, and which is regarded as one of the best, you know, action movies ever and, and dramas and, you know, uh, and then, um, there's, you know, there's quite other film, other films and TV shows that do it. And some of them do handle it badly, but some of them do it really well, I think. Um, and, uh, so I, I, I draw inspiration from at least the ones I feel that were done well. Um, and I think they're pretty fun, especially when they set up, like, for instance, this, uh, wild event that the story comes to at the beginning, but it's actually the end of the story. And you're so then a lot of the rest of the story is, you know, you know, this big moment is coming, but how do we get there? So then you, you fall, it's kind of like a mystery at that point where you're, you're connecting all these dots and, and you're uncovering how we get there. And that kind of thing is, is a lot of fun for me as a viewer. Um, when we actually was thinking of, uh, is that movie? What's that film? Oh, gosh, I can't remember the name of it. That Christopher Nolan did. It was like his first movie. Um, Memento. Yes, I love that film. How it did all that weird twists and and makes and fake outs and and uh, uh, you know big surprises. How it went back and forth through the timeline of that movie. Uh, I, I I even wonder like how they even like. I mean, it's a very complex movie. Sometimes I wonder how when they're writing it and making it, how they even like able to do it without getting like lost not that i'm saying that makes the viewer get lost but i'm just imagining myself as a writer like <laughs> how do you keep up with all those connections and and then make it pay off you know it, it's just wild to me worst but case scenario it, you end up really end up, well worst case scenario you end up looking like the um conspiracy guy meme with all with all the with all the lines of yarn all over the wall right <laughs> i've seen that in movies um <laughs> and tv shows I've, Especially uh, crime thrillers. Yeah, and odd, oddly enough, when I think when I think of an instance of do, of of doing a, of doing narrative jumps wrong, like when because mm. because somebody had asked me a long time ago what, well not that long ago, but what would be a good example of doing it wrong? And I know some people defend this movie, but I'd actually go with the recent Venom film as an example of what not to mm. do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, I that was yeah. I, I see what you mean. Um, I was half and half on that film. Like, I feel like they could have done better, but I still enjoyed it. I thought it was a fun ride. Um, once it actually gets off its ass, it's yeah, a good movie. Once it gets like, yeah, you're right. Yeah, but I can I can sit I consider that um, it's a it's a case of a of a bad setup and a good and a good follow through, and that's and I I um. When I found out that there were some last-minute rewrites, I wasn't surprised. Mm-hmm. Um, but, and granted, that's not doing flashback. That's doing time jumps, and it does. And the thing is, when you do, when you do a, when you do a sort of time jump or fla- or flashback or something like that, you are messing with the momentum of the story. And when you do, when you do it twice, um. You're basically using the same. You're basically abusing the same trick. I do. Th- hmm. I do think. I do think that the reason why something like Pulp Fiction is able to get is able to get away with it is it's get is all the ju- all the jumping about is giving f- is giving further context to other things you've already seen. Right. Because you look at you look at that o- at that opening setup and there's not a whole lot that you really know. About what about what's going on, and then you're getting more and more context about what's going on. Memento pulls the same trick, kind of. Yeah. But. Yeah, I was, that kind of stuff always fascinates me too. Yeah. Like, you know, as a writer, um, you know, of course now my 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 later years, I'm paying more attention to you know how things are written and put together and structured and mm-hmm. uh, you know both and just understanding how stories are made, but also, you know, as inspiration for my own projects. And uh, it's quite fascinating, you know, especially like looking at Tarantino's uh, works and uh, like Christopher Nolan and, uh, you know, trying to figure out how their mind works and and how they came that, you know, 
decided to do it this way and that way and uh why it made sense to them to to do that um, with no with nolan i do know for a fact that he absolutely resents the idea of doing things the with the traditional method he's uh -huh. <laughs> he's of, now of course of course somebody could bring up some uh, something like tenet to sh to, de to demonstrate the fact that he de that he doesn't like doing things traditionally but that's kind of been that's kind of been his thing for a while um right I do um although when it comes to when it comes to Nolan there and when it comes to a lot of authors even even when they're dipping into different types of stories there are certain um there are certain there are certain motifs that they will still that they will still fall back on as a matter of their of uh, being their particular um, comfort zone or in some cases their signature um when it comes to Nolan it's it's a ca it's a case of there's a lot of emotion versus reason in his work, mm. um, and when it com when it comes to um, Tarantino, I'd say I'd say it's a I'd say it's a lot of well, Grindhouse, and he that was that that was he's basically making films that are that are inspired by the stuff he grew up on, and he grew up on those um, Grindhouse theaters of the of the seventies, right. Um, and the that does bring when it comes to when it comes to chaotic flux. Now, within within the span of within the span of a of a few ish of a few issues, you've had to you've had to introduce a lot. Like you've had to introduce the characters that we're dealing with, the world that they're in, some of the rules that the that this world has to establish, and. Mm -hmm. How 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 do you go about that in a way to in a way to make sure that you don't overwhelm a reader? Uh, good question. Um, well, it's a, a, a lot of, for me has been kind of um, for some of it. I don't say a lot, but some of it is uh, I will um, test things out. I guess you know. In putting, structuring the story, structuring the the pacing and the the events um, that unfold, mm -hmm. and uh, and then you know, then you know, trying to see does that fit right there? Is that too much? Is this too little? Uh, so I do make uh, quite a few adjustments um, on that when when I'm writing the scripts, um, and uh, I'll I'll give it to you know, friends and, and uh, also I'll give it to some people that I just know, but aren't going to be, you know, really attached to me. So I don't worry about bias too much. Um, I'll have them read it and tell me what they think if it's too much of this or too much of that. And, um, and what I've, I, I guess what I'm, I'm learning more recently is um, how to balance also story and action uh although like i said with this issue there's a lot of action uh but that's because the first two were going pretty good and this one it just you know it's a kind of a force, full force part of the storyline in terms of the action and then the next one it's more like she four i plans for it, it, it it's going to be more of a um more the, on the complex storyline or story side but um also more uh dark and dramatic mm -hmm. still gonna be lots of action just it's gonna be more about uh building the relationships with some of the characters and also some traumatic and wild events that happen in their lives um so that's one of the things i've been looking at with kayak flux as well is not yes you're gonna have this the, the whole storyline has this overall feel but each issue I'm kind of also making a little different from one another, uh, different um, tones here and there, uh, just to break things up some and, uh, and, and also offer big surprises uh, when I can uh, to readers. Um, but um, was, what, what was it going on? Um, so, the uh okay getting not giving them too much okay so 
that was early on i was looking at okay well how much how do i introduce these characters how do i start opening this door into this world and uh you know giving the reader um not too much but enough to get them interested get them hooked and uh and wanting more by the time they finish you know reading the first issue the second one and so forth um so i watching again watching a lot of movies and what have you um i did a, a thing in issue one where i mentioned earlier where a lot of films will or tv shows will have a big event at the beginning like they show you like a big event that's coming in the storyline and then they jump back to the past and then we're working to get to that in the storyline i did that with chaotic flux uh, where I introduce the idea that there is Malakar, who's a dark sorcerer, who's created this giant army. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, you know, I introduce three of the main members of the Crimson Flame, uh, the team in the comic book, and give you an idea uh, that they are a team and they are trying to uh, figure out how to take out Malakar and his army. And, uh, and then they jump into action. And then I... But I, I wanted to, you know, that's that's kind of your teaser for a big event that's happening. And then I jump back to the past a little bit to um, we focus on Zasara. Mm -hmm. And Zasara is kind of like my, because uh, I decided to do the story where, uh, like, you remember the X-Men film? So Wolverine mm -hmm. is your, your uh, you know, your, your viewpoint into that world. You know, he joined the X-Men at the beginning and you're learning about the X-Men as you're going along through him that world so the Sathara is like a wolverine in my in that sense for for chaotic flux he's or she's uh being thrown into this world where these horrible monsters are taking over and she's having to deal with that all of a sudden in her life um and then i'm opening more and more about the dread fiends as we go along showing you what they're capable of um eventually we'll learn their origin uh, right now, we're going through Zathara's uh, past, how she gets to where she becomes this, uh, how she started first, first becomes this awesome warrior, and this organization called the Purging Hand has been hunting her down for uh, most of her life mm -hmm. that wants to wipe her kind out. Um, so there's, there's you know, slowly bridging you into those guys. Uh, and then also the other characters, the other heroes in issue three, you're now getting uh, more introduced to Soren. You see all him in issue one. You saw Strife in issue one, but now you're getting more of them in issue three, and you're getting a, a glimpse of their relationship that they they form together in the storyline, where they form this kind of brothers in arms uh, um, uh, camaraderie and, and a relationship with each other. Um, and then you also are going to get to see uh, when Zathara first basically falls into their lives. And they start to work together, and uh, you know the, the beginning of the Crimson Flame. Mm -hmm. So it's all just kind of gradually easing in, uh, but also big action moments uh, sprinkle in as well, and uh, big dramatic moments. And so it's 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 kind of um, you know, I, I guess now that I'm thinking about how I structure stories um, at this moment. I I try to. You know, take one segment, this moment here, and then I'll add another one. And you know, th this here's some drama, here's some uh, character growth, here's some world building, here's some, you know, introduction to another villain, and you know, uh, or another hero. So uh, it's just you know, so it's more like I guess like a giant puzzle and breaking up all these little pieces. So you, you know, it's <laughs> I don't know. Um, I don't know, it's kind of weird describing how it works uh, versus just sitting down and writing, uh, but uh, but yeah, that's that's kind of the overall how I how I do it. Um, I I just try not to be overwhelming with one element uh, for too long or, or overwhelming at all, and um, and uh, you know just little pieces as we go along, and you know actually remembering earlier when you were talking about going back and forth being past and present and uh you kind of think of it that way where you um you give them a little bit of this character and then you jump to someone else so mm -hmm. you know it doesn't feel like oh we're just focusing on Cesar all through the whole thing or, or, or another character so um 
Oh, I remind myself too. When you watch a lot of movies Mm -hmm. and they have the big epic battle at the end, but they don't just show you like there's different battles going on really in the main battle. So like for instance, return of the King, there was all that stuff going on in that one giant battle, but they didn't just focus on one character or two characters and their battle for the whole thing. It jumped to all these different characters, but it was all a culmination of this gigantic battle. So uh, that's, also how I think about uh, when I write, especially battles and, um, and but also just the overall story. Um, actually, I shouldn't say that. Right now we're not, eventually that's gonna be in the battles. Right now we're, they're small battles, but they're, mm-hmm. they're, they're big on their scale, but they're focused on few characters at the moment. But that's what I should say is the going from characters to battles to um, character growth and what have you. Uh, I break it up like that like you would see in those big epic battles where you have everybody doing their thing but yeah it's not just this guy or that guy or her or whatever now when now uh, when it comes to this for all intents and purposes this is still an this is still an action comic mm-hmm. and a a um a concern I've a concern that I could see so, that I could see some have when it comes to the flow of, so- of something like that is focusing so focusing so much on the action that no room is given to the atypical moments the um the moments of things calming down mm. um and what I'm cu- I'm curious about is if if um if that if what do you, what do your take on what do your take on the importance of those calmer moments cuz any, because anybody can um, talk about talk up how much they're writing how much they're writing up a um, action scene, but it's in uh, it's in the moments that give that give those scenes context where the um, where the weed is separated from the chaff, for lack of a better <laughs> term. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I sometimes like when I okay, so when I wrote um, these these these. The first two and the, the, these three scripts that we're up to now, mm-hmm. and um, my wife is um, uh, my my main editor. She's really good at, at uh, um, structures, you know, ping, ping the fine the fine tuning on it. And uh, she's she said that before, like, you sure this is not just like, you know, it's too much as far as. Um, the uh you know not letting the audience to breathe mm-hmm. uh, like kind of what you were saying uh, a second ago and um and in my mind well that's another thing too like trying to find that sweet spot for giving people the impression or the not the impression but the uh, um uh that moment of like you know good strong heavy action, but not going too far, not going too much. And uh, the way the action is structured in issue three, yes, it's, it's, it's flows, you know, and it goes, uh, it goes and goes, but there are breakups. There are moments of where their audience can rest and I made sure to put that in there. Um, So yeah, I definitely think that that is important. Uh, You shouldn't just, you know, go and go and just have nothing but you know, no action or nothing but action. You know, you see even in like heavy action movies, the characters, you know, will take breaks. So even yeah, uh, I, I love a lot of action movies now where they do these these long crazy battles where it's like, especially the no cut battles. Those are fun. You've, prob- uh, you've probably seen the Protector, haven't you? <laughs> no, actually, I haven't seen Protector. Um, no. There is a. There are certain films that are that are known for that. For, for lack of a better term, that one mm-hmm. scene and the protector right. is one of those cases because there is, there is a, there is a fight scene in the in that and I that go, I think that, I think it goes for, for about for about ten minutes mm-hmm. and it is one long continuous mm-hmm. take. Yeah, they did it also in uh, I think all of the seasons of the Daredevil show. There's one fight scene in each season where it's. It's like 10, 15 minutes long of one, one long take of him just kicking bad guys uh, all over the place. But um, I'm trying to I'm trying to think if if in those scenes there there were um ca- there were camera cuts 
because in, mm -hmm. in this instance there isn't, and you can you can probably find the scene on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll check it out. I, I haven't seen The Protector. Uh, it sounds like something I need to, <laughs> an action movie I need to see. Mm -hmm. But uh, but yeah, so I I do feel it's important. I think that you should give the audience time to breathe. Um, and uh, like I said, there are some you know decent breaks in issue three. And then, I mean, yeah, issue three. And then issue four, like I said, it's going to, there's, there's the, that one, the action that's going to be in that one, it's, it's very raw. It's going to be very um, radical and violent, uh, but it's going to have issue four is going to be more on the dramatic side uh, with the characters going through and it's going to be more, more story um, than action uh so that's something i think is is going to be fun to play with where you know there's overall less action but the action that's in it is going to be more intense um in terms of uh what happens to you know those short moments what happens in those short moments um versus a long fight um and then uh yeah, so I, I, yeah, definitely what you said. Uh, give people a, a chance to breathe, um, and and also, uh, you know, a, a chance to reflect and think about you know what happened and, and know how that happened. And you know, as much as awesome as you want to make your fight your your fights and your action and stuff, you want to give the audience time too to go, oh wow, that was awesome. You know, if it is awesome, which hopefully it is, and um, and you know they they really enjoy it. Mm -hmm. Um, in. In that re in that regard in that regard, um, some something else that I'm cu something else that I'm curious about is, and maybe maybe you maybe you um, put this in ish issue two and I and I just forgot which is certainly a possibility but with the with you know how with the, with a lot of the comics that we grew up reading um, there would all there would always be that one or two page catch up, um, is that something that you're planning on put planning on putting in when it comes to when it comes to some of the fa factors for the st for the story um oh you mean i see what you mean uh like a little thing the blurb at the beginning mm -hmm. that okay um i've considered doing something like that at some point depending you know as we go further along uh because i do you know as much as i i do try to do uh where you have excuse me um in the, like in the current campaign, you can get the last two issues if you missed out. But eventually, that's going to become, you know, because I, I plan the series to be somewhere between, I think, 30 to 50 uh, issues. Um, but uh, I can see where people eventually get to the point where I'm not going to get 30 books, you know, that's well, mail order 30 books. And, you know, some people are just not going to pay it or or what have you, except for like the really hardcore uh, people who really want to get it. But um, so uh, I do um, see the importance of that, you know, uh, at some point of putting a little uh, catch up at the beginning, at least. So yeah, that's that's, that's probably something I'm gonna I'm gonna do, or I think mm -hmm. I will have to do. And you kind of have you kind of have some elements of that of that particular catch up thing in. Um your wet in your website what what, mm -hmm. what with the what with the pages on the set on the setting itself and i could easily see those getting integrated if you eventually do a trade right yeah yeah um i i do I indeed plan on doing a trade eventually um it might be even after issue four or five for the first one um depends on how you know i'll work all that out and how things go but uh um, and that's something I would like to do at some point too, if like do like a box volume of, of books, if people would be interested in that. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, I'm not going to jump into that if, you know, if it, if it's just going to be too ridiculous for people to order, you know, big sets of books like that. I'm not, I'm not sure how well, I haven't seen a, a Indigo campaign or, you know, a crowdfunder or a, independent comic that has done that yet so um yeah. i mean ethan's been doing like some like he's doing a, a set now but it's only like that big whereas 
you know, eventually Kayak Flux is going to be like a box like that or something. So I don't know. We'll see. Um, now, given, given the fact that you mentioned a more sorcerer like like character um early on early on in this i'm cu i'm curious wh i'm curious what you, what your take is on br on um, bringing in the for what for what amounts to the equi the equivalent of so, of some of some sort of magic because up because up until this point ev even as bonkers as chaotic flux can get um it's very much leaned in the realm of of pulp, of pulp SF. Hmm. And something something I'm curious about is is if that's the if that's the um, approach that you int you intend on continuing, or do you think you're going to be dip dipping into uh, into other styles as more of the world is explored? Well, uh, I do have. Like I mentioned before, um, Malakar, yeah, uh, who's this dark sorcerer. Um, well, he's. I, I guess quick answer is yes, as far as uh, uh, magical elements, mm -hmm. um, but it's it's more like uh, for these characters that can do it, um, it's more like they're, they're they're pulling from another dimension the the power to use in ours. Um, and, uh, there will be three main sorcerer type characters in the, in the series. And that's Nalaria. She's a fire based mage. Pagan is a plant based mage and, uh, Balakar, who is a, a dark sorcerer or black magic. And, um, he's actually, um, Nalaria's brother and Pagan's son. His name is Gabriel. And, uh, but it's not him who is the darkness. Um, he is dabbling in dark magic, and this dark entity named Malakar um, uh, finds or finds him, or uh, and uses him, because Malakar exists on another dimension, and Malakar is the embodiment of all the uh, dark thoughts of man, and uh, he hates his own existence, so he wants to. Uh, wipe out humanity in order to for his him to, to stop you know being um and he and basically possesses gabriel and uses him as a vessel to interact with our world and through gabriel he becomes this kind of ultimate um uh dark super being that the team has to deal with yeah. later on in the storyline um so I mean that's that's basically the the idea how those characters are going to work. Um, they you know so they'll be channeling um, great power of the elements uh, and and the dark magics mm -hmm. from other dimension from another dimension into ours. Um, people are, are in this world are very few of them, but some of them are born with the ability to to do this, and uh, in particular, Nilaria and Pagan and and. Uh, Gabriel, their family, um, has been able to do it, and uh, they are actually guardians of a uh, of a city, a small city of um, uh, these people that can they can do it and uh, channel the magic. But there's not a whole lot of them. Uh, like I said, it's pretty rare for people to be able to do it. But um, in the past, these people have been hunted down for their ability. Um, in the ancient times. And so then they built this kind of solitude city that is cloaked from the outside world. And Gabriel, I was just say, um, Pagan's family, uh, they're, they're the protectors of this this little uh, village of, of sorcerers. Yeah. And give... The, th the, the, reason, the reason I, fi I fixate on... On the introduction of magic into this setting, even if it even if it is involving alternate dimensions, mm -hmm. is there is I've 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 learned through I've learned through ex through my experiences that it's important to have a decent set of rules to fa to fall back on, mm -hmm. and 
and that and whenever you're br whenever you're bringing in something where you can do potentially anything with it like magic you need you need to be able to rein that in and i'm guessing i'm guessing that's so that's um, something that's that's been under consideration when you when you were bringing in um, sorcery mm -hmm. yeah um there's first there's an element in the in that in terms of rules mm -hmm. um they have to be under the right mental condition to be able to pull uh, from that other dimension into our world the, the, the energy to do what they, they were trying to do. Mm -hmm. um, also, uh, there's um, an idea I have where they can be cut off from that as well. Um, uh, so blocked from using their, their power from that other dimension. Um, and uh it also there's there's uh mental strain um on the characters if they you know exert their power too much mm -hmm. um now and that's not without saying that and that's not saying that they can't do like some really awesome stuff with it it's just that um again keep in mind that they will be you know limited to an extent um even the technology uh um in the series like the soren's exosuit mm -hmm. uh, the exosuit pilot he is. Uh, he does have a limited power source um, that uh, you know he can, he can pull pull from uh, at a time, and then after he has to you know after a while he'll have to recharge. Um, but again, he can pull off you know really you know big powerful attacks and and, and things like that. But mm -hmm. he is he is limited. Um, so yeah, that is definitely something I keep in mind often. Uh, one just you know I don't want them to be you know as they say OP too overpowered. And that sort of thing but also you know it helps keep things interesting as well it, it um you know uh there's uh, if you just make a character just way too powerful there's not that fun right so um because you you one of the things i I'm, I'm a big believer in and well i mean i experience it reading stories and what have you and, and watching stories and playing games or whatever the um the heroes that you're rooting for, and sometimes even villains, uh, you um, you want to feel that connection with them. And the more they're unlike a human, the more they're you know can't feel pain, can't feel you know don't have problems and all these things. The less you feel that connection, the less you can put yourself in those shoes and feel for that character. Um, so I think that's very important as well. Um, but uh, but again, also just to make things fun, you know, amp that that drama up you know now and then uh that you know something's gone wrong or or uh um you know they just overexerted themselves or, or what have you mm -hmm. and i should i should note that as soon as as soon as you said the uh, the whole thing of make of making a character too op my mind immediately w went to um the highly overrated black panther film mm. You know, because that because the suit in that basically has the Superman problem. Hmm. Like for all for all intents and purposes, just it just invul just um way too way too invulnerable. So when you have two people in the suit fighting, you're there's no real peril. Right. <laughs> Good point. Oh. And when it can Plus, the, that's plus when you when you stop and think about it, a lot of the um, ev a lot of the good a lot of the good examples of doing the, of even doing the whole of even doing the whole enhanced enhanced fi enhanced fighter or some sort of superhero thing has su has some sort of limits. In video games, obviously, you can get away with a lot more in the case of limits because, well, it's a game. You gotta make it. You gotta make it um, have some level of difficulty, but. E but even in that, there are small th there are small things that that can be done to um to inf to enforce that to enforce that limitation and enforce that yeah th yeah they might be a badass among badasses but they're n but even they have limits right which is always going to be um more relatable than the than well the v the v the um. The Gary Stu or Mar or Mary Sue approach of ma of making something so imp so impossibly um strong, hmm. um, and give 
is when you mentioned the exo when you mentioned the exosuit was was it a case where you had where you had set it up that the main the main way it recharges is simply just be, is just not being active um that is part of it it's it's actually uh it, it can draw power from the sun as well and um it can even uh adapt to accept other power sources um so if there's like for instance uh you know a power plant sitting around or whatever and you know you can access that and, and mm -hmm. charge up the suit um so you know there there's versatility to that um but uh but again the, the i mean the suit can go you know for a good amount of time and do a lot but uh but again there is there is a limitation that we have to, to kind of you know pull back and <laughs> now also um i didn't want to have it to where like okay the suit's just useless you know when it runs out and it just sits there uh so it's more like it has a reserve that it kind of just cuts off um at certain points of like okay now i can't use this ability now i can't use that ability um but he you know because i don't want his sword to just be totally defenseless when it drops the power and then he's just like screwed so uh it's more like uh safety marks that kick in for the suit um and tells him okay you can't do that now you can't do this um and then so that he can pull out of, mm -hmm. of battles or whatever uh so he's not just a sitting duck and yeah and what have you um uh but it's going to be more too so that it's uh i guess the bigger longer battles that he's going to have that difficulty um because he'll still like like for instance he'll be in a battle and he'll pull off a, ma a major attack and then okay now he can't use that one because he's drained it low enough at that point but he's still able to do a lot of other things and still maintain you know himself in a battle as long as it's not like some crazy you know long 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 battle to where he will have to uh rely more on his teammates to um you know keep him going <laughs> i guess yeah uh but that's another thing too like i'm a big fan of of team-based comics and mm -hmm. especially the x-men and how these characters or how the characters you know will uh, benefit one another and do team up attacks and strategies and all these things and it's some, definitely something that's going to be in the book as well so um you'll see though they they really you know come together as this uh really dynamic fighting force to where you know they don't have to just rely on themselves and, and what have you so you know they always got backup they always got um you know support um you know bring out granted they're not all taken out but uh at, at the same time i've, I've made the team pretty well diverse in that sense to where it's going to be pretty hard to like take them all down to where they're just all defenseless. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it, it, it's, there's a lot going on. It's, it's going to be a lot of fun, like introducing everybody, especially or they're introducing all the characters when I get to that point and really showing off what this team is capable of. But also at the same time, you know, I made the enemies uh, not something you can bat an eye at, you know, they're just, they're really crazy and powerful and, so you're still going to have a lot of awesome challenges for this team. Mm -hmm. Um now I I will ad I will admit that um there we've talked we've talked a bit about several of the members of the Crimson Flame but there is there is one that I given given my particular gimmicks that I I feel I I feel I need to go into and what and that is the um giant in the room quite literally. <laughs> With get with Garadith, hmm. um, was that was when it came to the sketching out of that character? Was that something that you um that you had that you had decided on early on of just having a bit just having a big swordsman in the group, or was it or was it something that came in um later? No, Garadith was yeah he was pretty early on idea I had for him. Um, he's yeah, I love uh, stories with big swordsmen in them, especially like big broadswords and that sort of thing. Uh, you like, probably you know, got a few I, volumes I'm... of Berserk in the in the back, don't you? <laughs> yeah, and uh, uh, you know, I watched a lot of the, the anime and the movies, and and um, you know, I'm a big fan of the, the old Conan, Conan movies, and um, uh, you know, I'm trying to think of something else. I'll tell my but uh, oh. Uh, I'm also a big fan of, of transforming swords. So mm -hmm. like in Thundercats, Lino's sword and, and um, 
uh, various other anime and what have you where the swords can change and do awesome things. Uh, oh, Battle Chasers. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with that book. but I, um, I am. Awesome. There's a, a, a big swordsman in that. I love that character. So mm-hmm. he's a big influence yeah. on, on Garrett for sure. And uh, a lot of these other, like Berserk and uh, these other, so a lot of other characters. Um, but yeah, early on, I wanted a guy with a big sword and, and a transforming sword. And, um, but I wanted to make him pretty well different um, as well. So I decided, well, well, it would be interesting to have a guy that's just really big. And uh, so in the case of Garrett, if he's eight feet tall and uh, but also then I was thinking, well, how would a guy that big be able to move around all that well as a swordsman? You know, because a lot of like big characters, they're slow and, and what have you. Mm-hmm. They can hit hard, but, you know, they're they're quite slow compared to other characters. And well, um, I'm fascinated by uh cat agility <laughs> and uh so their ability to mainly to uh um, jump really high so for, for their for their size you know so uh if you take you know think about well like, a cat when they're just jumping up on um something that's like four or five feet tall or, mm-hmm. or you know um i've i got a couple cats and they'll jump all the way to the top of my bookshelf which is almost six feet tall and i'm like geez from the top bottom you know from the ground and so for a person that's like jumping on top of a house with no problem you know so i thought well that's pretty, pretty awesome if this guy had the muscle elasticity um of a cat's and uh that would you know break that whole thing where he would be limited in a movement because now he can jump really high and and you know, be fast and agile as a huge dude. Mm-hmm. Um, now, gravity still plays a factor, but a lot less than it would be if he was, you know, just an eight foot tall guy. And um, so there's a event, there's a, in the storyline that happens of how, because he's not born that way. It's a, uh, um, uh, it's a genetic changing of his, his DNA that, um, that gives him that ability. There's even, I won't say anything, but there's a video that happens that, that, um, causes that mm-hmm. and um and then so now you got this guy that can do crazy flips and all these things but he's eight feet tall and he has a giant transforming sword and the sword is, has actually two swords that are four feet tall four feet long mm-hmm. and uh they will combine with the hilt to become a double bladed sword if he wants and then they transform they can transform and open up and unleashing this powerful energy from within them Mm-hmm. And uh, he uses it in some, I got a, r- a lot of radical ideas for how that's that's all going to work, especially when he throws, because he can throw the sword um, a far distance and it will return to him. It has mm-hmm. a, uh, a homing kind of device into it. Yeah. Um, much like Captain America's short shield will, you know, reattach when he throws it and it comes mm-hmm. back to him. Um, so that's going to be fun, a lot of fun to play with and, and see in action. Uh yeah, definitely he was an early on character. I was like, okay, I, I just, you know, I love those types of characters and I had to have him in there. And spe- um, speaking of that, are there, were there any, um, when you were design when you were designing the cast, were there, and I may have asked this previously, but were there any characters that, um, that you, that you ended up having to re have, having to retool to get, to get the idea down pat mm. more, several times or was that, or was it a case of, um, experimenting all over the board uh not, not too much um i had some redesigns on uh zathara um a few here and there uh mainly her hair I, at first i was gonna have her because she can form these crystal like structures um for weaponry and or um different other things she'll use it for but she mainly uses it for weaponry and, and um i at first was gonna have her like she's born with no hair she's just hairless and uh she but she wants to see seem more normal so she decides early on she wants to hair have hair look more like a person you know a normal person even though she's has the blue skin and the strange eyes but so then they would be a um she would make crystal structures for her eyebrows and her hair but then i was like well it wouldn't be uh what's the word it wouldn't be very um practical or um 
easy to deal with if there's just crystals hanging down when she's fighting and things like that. So, so then it just became, uh, she, it's more like, a uh, a kind of spiky ish hair, the way it grows. Um, so it's, it's kind of like, she's just got gel in her eyebrows and mm-hmm. her hair all the time to make it kind of spiky, but it's still hair and like it flows and, and all, what have you. Yeah. Um, so kind of a middle ground there to get that, that same style, but still it be, you know, not just something that's stuck on her head and doesn't move or whatever. Mm-hmm. And, um, her suit also, um, I had it more, uh, revealing before, but I didn't think that was all that practical for combat. So I decided to give her more of a, I, I went for more of a cybernetic kind of look to the suit, more of a, a high tech, um, but still flexible because she's yeah. very agile and, and acrobatic in the storyline. Mm-hmm. Um, Sor and his was interesting. The exosuit, uh, I wasn't quite sure how I wanted it. I mean, I knew I knew how I wanted a lot of the weaponry, and I knew I wanted it to be um, uh, stylish and recognizable, but also functional and you know, um, you know, realistic in terms of it just just doesn't just look cool, you know. Um, and so, uh, how I designed it was, I just I took a bunch of. Um, Things I, I elements of uh, different things I liked that I found online, to different robots and, and what have you. Um, like I take arm designs and head and just different parts, and I told my artist, say, oh, I, I like this tile of arm and this and this and that and that. You know, uh, could you come up with something, you know, along that line, but still, you know, as, as original as possible? And and he did a great job with with designing that. So really, um, you know, like I said, on Soren, I wasn't quite sure how I wanted the Reaper exosuit to look. Um, but yeah, that, there's not too much, uh, like I said, back and forth. Um, I still have designed Garadif and, and Pagan and Nalaria, but I have a, I already have a lot of great, um, interesting ideas for how their designs are going to be. Um, I just haven't sat down and sketched them out yet because, uh, you know, character designs aren't cheap, so yeah. <laughs> I'm waiting for when those characters come in, and then mm. you know we'll go down that road. Yeah. Um. Now, some now something else that something else I've noticed is that, unless I'm mistaken, you've been sl- the page count for subsequent issues has slowly been going up. Mm-hmm. Um. When when it came to individual issues, did you have a set? Did you have a set amount of pages that you had in mind, or was a ca- or was it a case of when you've got a when you've got a proper break point, I and it definitely was the case at first. I uh, was really trying to get it down to more of a traditional comic book. So you know, your average comic book is maybe twenty four pages at most. Mm-hmm. It's usually I think more like twenty twenty two pages nowadays. Uh, but as I was writing the first script, um, or I, you know, I got to the tail end to it, and I. I even I there was some parts in it if I remember right that I took out and saved it for issue two, um, so it was actually going to be longer and it turned up ended up being twenty six pages, and I just couldn't cut down anymore. There was stuff in there I really wanted to get in there and really you know having that that particular kickoff to the storyline, and uh, and then in issue. Two, it was like I said, it was some left over from one into that one, and then again, I, I ran into that problem at the end. We're like, I, I can't cut it down. They're just, and um, actually, there was one battle that's an issue two that I um, decided I can't wait on that, and it will work somewhere else. So I took that out, and that's going to come a little later. Mm-hmm. Um, not sure when yet. It's going to be issue issue four though, um, but. I'm also looking at now going two, like two, it's been two pages more with each one so far. Now we're on issue three and it's up to 30 pages. Well, you know, the more pages you add, the more it costs to print um, the books. So I'm really like looking at that hard to like, I can't, you know, I can't go, you know, past 30. Um, and I'm issue four, uh, the way I've been, you know, why it's going so far with the writing and, and 
how I have in mind for the overall thing. It's going to be less than 30 pages. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm pretty confident. I mean, I may be wrong, but right now it, it, it I think it's going to be less than 30. It's going to be, I'm, I think it's going to be more of the, like the first issue, 26, maybe 28. But um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's just kind of like I had planned one way and then, then just as the writing went, it ended up being, you know, the other. Um, <clears throat> and I'm trying to get better at, at uh, uh, judging how the story, how long the story is going to be. And also, you know, how important this part needs to be in the book or can I wait till later or do, do I even need it in there at all? Um, yeah, so <laughs> well, a lot, of well, tri- well, a lot of it's trial and error. There's a lot, yeah. so much of this is trial and error, so well, you know, um, they do say the first casualty is always the plan, mm-hmm. and <laughs> when it and, besi- and besides, um, a lot something something that i've something that i've obviously noticed with a lot of um comic indiegogos that i've co- that i've covered over the over the past 2 years is a lot a lot of the people involved with it could be described as having more passion than common sense mm. <laughs> and given how this given how chaotic flux is a is a story that you've um ha- that you've had kicking around for years and ye- years and years even before mm. you started the kickstarter for the first issue I'd say that's apropos, but now you had lo- now you you launched the Kickstarter um, yesterday technically. Mm-hmm. And it's hard, and I know I know it's on Indiegogo, but I'm j- it's a case of um, bad habits. <laughs> but now you've now you've got you've got you've already gotten about twelve percent in, which is impressive for j- for just the first day. Um, what are you shooting for with issue three as far as a release window? Like, are you shooting for um, this fall? Or are you shooting for um, 2022? Now, um, I'm actually shooting right now. Like, I, I've been saying May. May feels pretty good. Uh, the um, pages... Uh, okay, so the illustrator is on... I think he's on page... 22 now so you know we're, we're, we're getting there um we're pretty close to the end and um so I, i'm pretty sure that uh it will be around may it might be a little after may but it's it's feeling pretty good that it's going to be done by may and or you know beginning of may i should say and then we'll start um because printing because when i go through mix them and they don't take too long mm-hmm. to send the books back um so it'd probably be like tail end of may that uh, we'll start shipping the books out, but it could be it could be Mar. I mean, uh, um, June. It could be June, but right now we're we're looking at May, uh, pretty well. All right, i i can de- I can definitely get I can definitely get behind that. Um, with all that said, I do I do want to sincerely thank you for being willing to come back to the temple and enjoy <laughs> the insanity at play here. <laughs> and. Anytime, oh, fun, you, mm-hmm. anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I as I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> here, here. <laughs> Even, no matter what, no matter what time of day, because remember, it's five o'clock somewhere. That's right. <laughs> but, and. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come on and enjoy the madness. And there'll be thanks plenty more where us. there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>